Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks, Michael. What an intro. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Hattie, it's just you and me and everybody listening and watching right now. Um, hey, I'm Kathy. so excited. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here speaking to you on launch day, actually. So that's yeah, always a bit special. <laughs> If anyone doesn't know what it looks like, this is the beautiful book that we're talking about. And I don't actually know what you're going to be making. So oh, I know I kept changing my mind, but um, a friend of mine said I should do wontons. So I'm making wontons. Um, but obviously, uh, I think a lot of people actually just don't realize that all my food is vegetarian. So that's one aspect um, that people, um, this, this kind of makes this a bit different because these are actually vegan wontons um made with they, i call them my simple vegan wontons they're mainly just tofu and um some seasonings and some herbs like cilantro and scallions so they're really yummy and um wow so I'm, I, I i can just kind of start making them how do you want to do this do you want to ask questions or should i just kind of make them while we're talking you can make them while you we're talking you can you know, pause if you need to dramatically gesture. <laughs> this is not a very dramatic recipe, so. Um, well, we're gonna go there, don't worry. <laughs> so I've just got like a block of extra firm tofu and I've just drained it. So I've just put it in a colander over the sink for about 10 minutes. And because I'm in my own kitchen, I'm just gonna be like walking around, That's getting funny. something here, getting something there. So this is this is the fun part. Um, so I basically, you've got this block of, um, tofu and then you're just going to mash you're just going to like basically throw everything in and then mash it all together so this is four scallions which i've just chopped up and have and you ever pressed your tofu i before? haven't pressed my tofu and i don't press my tofu very often at all mm -hmm. um i use a lot of tofu in my cooking obviously because i'm vegetarian but i find the extra firm stuff is not that it's not it doesn't have that much liquid so I usually just drain it. Even when I do, um, I do a lot of pan fried tofu, which I either put in sandwiches, put in tacos, put in um, salads, like I just strip, I just cut up into strips and I never press it. Um, I know that there's also like that more, you know, that brand that has the more pressed tofu, like the hard tofu oh, that's dried. You know, yeah, almost Sorry. dried. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm, I'm a very kind of, simple if I can skip a step yeah. I will and basically I do it like this because it's the one with the way my mum did it so she never pressed tofu so I'm not going to either um, so I've just put in there about half an inch of chopped ginger uh, a little handful of chopped cilantro and that was four scallions then I'm going to put in I think that's about two cloves of garlic that's been chopped up I love this I love this ease <laughs> just kind of mel melding it together exactly and then we're going to add some seasonings mm -hmm. so we've got some good old Lee Kum Kee soy sauce Kum Kee Hong Kong mm -hmm. brand exactly so I'm going to put and like your folks are from Guangdong province but I'm not sure are they from Hong Kong so they're from Jungsan um my, both my parents are from Jungsan which is a district of Guangdong province okay. and they both my mum lived in Hong Kong for a little while so obviously like the passage out they uh, my dad left China when he was a bit younger in his teens um, and he was working in Australia with his dad and my mum um, had kind of a rougher you know passage out um, China on the precipice of the cultural right. revolution so she kind of went to Macau and then Hong Kong spent some time there kind of waiting to get her papers to get to Australia mm. and um she came to Australia to marry my dad so it was they're from a, a, um, a similar the same village but and mm. the families knew each other but um that was where, why she went to Australia so and that was in the early 60s and they went to Sydney and you grew up then in a suburb outside of Sydney I grew up in a suburb of that's called Kings Grove about like 20 minutes outside of the what we call the city in Sydney um but you know it was a fairly white neighborhood we were kind of it's funny because they were actually like four Chinese families on our street but they were all our family oh, right. <laughs> so we live right next door to my my dad's sister and her family and my dad's 
other sister and his his mother lived on the corner, which we called the house on the corner. And for some time, my dad's other aunt lived on the other side of us. Wow. Um, so we were, you know, we all lived, many of us lived on the same street, but um, we were all, we were all family. So the area is very diverse now. And one of the largest populations, Asian Chinese population outside of China. Mm. Um, so it's really changed a lot. But back then we were, you know, definitely in the minority. This is just some shots in why I'm putting two teaspoons and I put in two teaspoons of um, just roasted sesame oil. And I'm just gonna pop in a little bit of sugar. And I've got a little bit of, that's about two teaspoons of corn flour or corn starch. We call it corn flour in Australia. So I always catch myself. Um, and I put that in basically to soak up any excess moisture because when you're making wontons and dumplings, actually, the, the enemy is, is too much moisture because it breaks, it breaks the skin. And I find it particularly when you're doing vegan or vegetarian fillings because it tends to be something like tofu, which is quite wet. Um, you know, like greens, if you're going to you know, cook down greens, spinach, bok choy, those things tend to be very wet. Mm -hmm. So just a bit of cornstarch or potato starch you can use too. It just soaks up any excess moisture and, mm -hmm. and um, makes it a bit more, it comes together. I find with when, you know, like when, when I was younger and I would help my mum make meat mm -hmm. dumplings or wontons, it wasn't so much of a problem, but she right. always used a bit of cornstarch yeah. just to dry it up too. I just added you know yeah. corn starch. it goes in there yes <laughs> and you know I think for a long time there was this thing about cornstarch like it wasn't healthy or you know like why did Chinese people put cornstarch uh, and everything because it's like it gives you a beautiful texture <laughs> I didn't know that one was also <laughs> oh well it's they're all on the list somewhere. But, um, <laughs> all under siege at some point. Oh no. At some at some point. At but some point. You know, we've gone through all this, and and for me, I've kind of come back to so many of these ingredients and just the food of my childhood. I'm like, I'm really proud that this is what I grew up eating, and proud of these flavors. Um, but for me, being vegetarian, I've just had to kind of, you know, play with it a little bit to get it to the point where I can actually yeah. eat it. So that's the um, filling that's done. Sorry, the, the camera's that? really far away from me, so I can't actually see it. That's colorful and beautiful. Um, but that's the filling, that's done. Oh. Beautiful. Okay, so before you show us how to fold those, I mean, you mm -hmm. can unwrap it and prep yeah, yeah. Um, it. Yeah, I actually just um, was listening to our conversation, which was almost two years ago to this date. Um, really? Wow. April 14th, yeah. That's amazing. When your book, Family, came out, your third cookbook, and we, I was interviewing you on Heritage Radio Network. Yes. Um, so during that, I was just refreshing my memory. You told me that each of your cook cookbooks um, to that point, which was community, neighborhood, and then family, they began with the title. You told me yes. that the title really inspired you. And then you sort of colored in the rest of the mm -hmm. idea behind it and the recipe. Yes. So I have to ask, is that the case for To Asia for Love with Love? No, it wasn't. And it was a different process altogether mm -hmm. because after I finished family and in family, there's an Asian chapter in all my books, actually, there's an Asian chapter because, um, you know, for me, like getting to this place of writing an entire book about Asian food really took a while. And it took mm -hmm. like this, it was this personal journey for me. And so after I finished family, I actually felt myself like wanting like more Asian recipes, like, I just wanted to develop more. I wanted to cook more of the food that I grew up with. And so that was the first idea was I wanted to do an Asian book. Okay. So the title itself, there was a lot of, the working title was Asian-ish and there was no way that was ever going to be the title. But, you know, that was kind of the feel of, of the food because, um, and, and so yeah, the title came later. And so for this book, I actually didn't, you know, my first three books, they're one word titles. Um, 
and I actually wanted to break out. Like there's so much about this book is just me breaking out and just doing something that is different. So I didn't actually want one word for it. I wanted lots of words <laughs> and I wanted it to be really descriptive. And for me, the very first word that I had in my mind um, for this book was a homecoming. So that was like my first thought when I wanted to do this book was I'm coming back to the food that I grew up with. It's like, this is, this is my homecoming. So um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a very different process. And I was really ready for this book to be actually really different to the other books, even though it obviously, all my work kind of goes together. I mean, it's all kind of one, in many ways, one continuous story. Um, I, th I don't really pre-plan it that way. It just is just the way I, I guess, tell my story through food. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this one was actually really different to the others, but you know, purposefully. Yeah, it sounds like you're really announcing your Asian-ness in this book. Yeah. And, and yeah. And I, so one other thing you told me was that your last book, Family, at that time, you said it was the most personal book of yours to date. <laughs> you think this one has succeeded it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I yeah. definitely, I think, um, you know, a lot of my journey in food um, came about by accident because I didn't really like start out to be a food journalist or to write cookbooks or to really cook. Like it was all just, I don't know, like my life just kind of, I just landed here and I, I found something that um, just felt like a way of me. Like, you know, I, I did struggle with my identity growing up all my life, whether I knew it or not, I did. And um, when I started to cook and the more I cooked and doesn't really even matter what cuisine it was that I was cooking, um, but just the act of cooking itself and and connecting with flavors and connecting with ingredients and connecting through people through the cooking, um, it kind of gave me this understanding of myself. So it's kind of the further out I went, the more I understood about myself personally. So I think that um, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that my work is always gonna be personal now. Mm -hmm. You know, like I didn't, um, I didn't set out for it to be this way, but I think that that is what inspires me the most about cooking and writing about food is, is writing it from a personal point of view um, as a way of connecting with people. Because I do really think that, you know, in this world where everyone is, people like to kind of emphasize differences and we're different and this and that. And I just think people are just kind of the same um, with different perspectives and I think food is such a great way of bringing people from all different walks of life from different cultures from you know all just all different experiences together I mean even for me like moving here from Sydney um, you know and I, I've lived in other places in the world before and just food is always like this this you know it's so, it's so grounding for me so um yeah, and I think a big, I think a big aspect of my work being very personal is be because I live away from home and I'm away from my mom, I'm away from my family. And so I have to work harder to connect, you know, with yeah. my, with my heritage because yeah. I now hold the key to my heritage for my own family, like for my kids. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I have to do, I have to do more work and that's, mm -hmm. I think that's that's probably a big aspect of what led me here actually. For for those who don't know how how amazing and unique Hetty is, um, I just have to say, like your your first cookbook um came out in 2014 and it was uh it was called Community, but Salad Recipes from Arthur Street Kitchen. And so it was inspired by your salad delivery business in <laughs> in your suburb of Sydney where you would um bike to your neighbors homes with your homemade salads um and it was just a really genuine uh project and it and i love how um it it sounds like that book it was self-published by you and yeah, you, 
And it originally, the original, um, you know, book develop, I mean, sorry, designer was one of your custom was one of your salad. Yeah. Customers. So it was like a real community <laughs> project. And of yeah. course, uh, Louisa Brimble was a photographer who is a big deal photographer now, but it was her first book then. And mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, you know, and then you, you, um, you sort of like had a surprise little hit with that book and then you <laughs> continued with the neighborhood salad sweets and stories from home and abroad and then family new vegetarian comfort food to nourish every day and um, so all this happened pretty quickly in the last mm. decade yeah yeah I mean I think most of my time that my books have been out you know you know the you know, community is a big deal in Australia it is kind of like this book that is sold and sold and sold over it came out again like I self-published it in 2013 and it came out again in 2014 through Pam McMillan Plum Book Books um, who are my Australian publishers and that book is just Amazing. it just keeps selling Amazing. I mean it's incredible <laughs> and um, it there was a second edition released in 2019 which was an anniversary edition which was really cool because I got to add stories to it I got to add stories of people who've been cooking and connecting over those meals for the last you know five years prior to that um, I added 20 20 new recipes mm. and so that was really special to be able to do that um, but that book itself and that business the salad business I mean that kind of marked my starting food everything I learned how to do all of this how to cook how to you know, create a recipe, how to put flavors together. Um, I learned how to do all of that actually on the job. So those people in that community were doing me a favor by actually eating my food <laughs> because I was learning, like I'd never, I've got no professional training as a cook. I've not, you know, I've not gone to culinary school. Um, all of this was kind of learned on the job. And yeah. I just, I'm so grateful for people for embracing, you know, the way I cook and and um you know sometimes that's it's it's cool to do things like that because there's no parameters you know actually sometimes having no knowledge of something really just frees you to um and, and like self-publishing that book it was not really meant to be like a big book or anything it was just for the people that bought salads off me so um that in itself like to be able to publish a book the way you want it um, I've always been a paper geek, so I love like paper and putting things together and photography and like how to create a story on on a piece of paper. I love print. Um, and so to be able to do that without any thoughts of, oh, is this going to be a commercial success? Who's going to buy this? I was like, I'm just creating this for like my salad customers who I adore, who I still adore. <laughs> and um, some of them are now my friends. And so when you kind of free yourself of all that, you know, all those usual things that you think about when you put a book, book together, like how, which category does this fit into, you know, who's going to be the target audience? Um, it really like, allows you creatively to create something really special. Mm -hmm. And so I try and take that spirit into all my other books that I've ever done. I mean, and my luckily I originate all my books with my publisher in Australia because that's just kind of the way it works um but luckily they're really they've always been really open to me doing that so they kind of be working out well yeah let me yeah let me I went to them and said I want to shoot it on film right fully Think expecting they could say that's amazing no. you shot and they said if anyone, if you whatever, you know, if anyone can do it, you can do it. Cause yeah, um, yeah so it, I was really lucky. And, and and why did you feel that you needed to shoot it on film? Not digital? I, yeah, I just really wanted to create some, a piece of work that was really special, that kind of stood out and was really timeless. You know, timeless timelessness is something I look for in basically all any project that I do, like even in Peddler, I just want timelessness. I want it to represent, um, you know, a, a lot of people over a, a long time. And so I think there's just this kind of timelessness, but nostalgia in film that is very hard to replicate. Um, 
digitally. And when we, when we shoot digital, we're always trying to make it look like film. So my thought process was like, why don't I just shoot it on film and then we don't have to really do that much work. And it actually is true. I mean, those photos are fairly unedited. Um, you know, it takes a few shots to get one that's good. But, and I did back everything up on digital, but I didn't use any digital shots at all. So, um, but it was just a, a creative process. And then the other aspect of it was, I really wanted to, I think my mum is very, um, she's very present in all my work she's very, definitely very present in this yeah. book um and I really wanted to have a connection to my dad who passed away when I was young as a teenager but my dad was an amateur photographer and always had cameras around the house and um he developed film in our laundry and it was just a big part of his life and it's kind of like the way we saw him was when he wasn't working, he was taking photos. And so um, I have his camera, so I, I wanted to kind of have that as homage to him. And Did you shoot um, this book with his camera, with his old camera? Some of it, yeah, yeah. There was a few different, I had two different cameras I was using. His camera is a fully manual uh -huh. Nikon camera. So it actually takes absolutely amazing photos, but it, it's it's a bit wow. of work to focus. So I had a um, a different film camera that was also uh, more of an automatic focus, um, just so it's a bit quicker. And then the photos of me, there's not that many photos of me in it, but there's a couple of photos that were taken by my friend Shirley Kai, who's and it was taken on a medium format. Um, Hasselblad mm -hmm. it was an amazing, they're amazing photos. So um, yeah. <laughs> it's it's really again it's a work of love and i love it it really evokes that title again since you have the word love in the title yeah. um, something about Thank the title you. it makes me think of um to asia with love like a like yeah. a like a gift tag right yeah. or, a, or postcard yeah um, i mean it's meant to be a letter so it's mm -hmm. kind of like when i thought of it to asia with love is um one of the titles from, as I think it was in Neighbourhood, um, you know how I was saying there's an Asian chapter in, in all my books. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to have a connection to one of my other books. And so To Asia With Love is the name of the Asian chapter in, in Neighbourhood. So that's why mm -hmm. I, uh, I think it's in there. Yes, it is because, oh, it, okay. it, yeah, it is. Um, and so that's where it actually came from. And it's written with a comma particularly because it is like a letter it's like yes yeah exactly. as you say like a postcard or right. something like that so. and do, do you feel like a sense of in being indebted to to Asia and to what your Asian heritage has has given you as a cookbook writer and as a recipe developer yeah I do I don't know if indebtedness I think indebtedness is is, is a very um immigrant trait you know like my mom feels very indebted to her host country you know Australia is as what it's given her but for me I have like a you know a one step removed um from her experience but I I feel indebted to the way I grew up and the way I grew up in an Asian household that was um very strict and um with a but a mother that you know it's very attentive parents a mother that was there all the time the mother a mother that cooked for me con us constantly mm -hmm. and um a, a mother who expressed everything through her food and like if I'm going to be honest that was not something I really appreciated that much growing up you know it's like kind of I just wanted to be like every other Australian kid I and I was like so self-conscious about all the things that made me different and so I was working so hard not to appear Chinese outside of the house even though at home you know we spoke Cantonese and we, it was a very Chinese household but um, so I struggled with that my whole life but that now as an adult and living away from my mum and having my own children like I am indebted to that experience of having um, that amount of love and that amount of exposure to my culture that was forced upon us because mm -hmm. um, it's hard you know as, as you know when you live in a, in a western world and you have you know parents from other countries or from a different culture you know it's 
it's easy just to be Western. Yeah. You know, because that's what's around us. So um, I do. And, and, you know, like this, and Australia is also a unique case because it is so close to Asia. And so Asian food is, is like Australian food, basically, uh -huh. yeah. you know, like it's yeah. just so much part of the DNA of Australia, you know, like there's, you go to a food, you have these things called food courts in Australia. So you go to a shopping center and every suburban shopping center has a food court. And in that food court, there'll be a Chinese takeaway place, you know, a Thai place, a Vietnamese place. And it's just so much part of our culture that um, you almost don't really think about it as not being Australian mm -hmm. food because Australia's Australian food is, and, and America is too, but it's just a slightly kind of different vibe um, being like a younger country and having this really robust um, cafe culture, like Asian food is just like what everyone eats <laughs> all the time. So, um, so it's, it's a definitely, so in this book is like an amalgamation of like all those influences mm -hmm. of being Chinese, living in Australia, but also having kind of that, that Australian food culture, um, you know, play a really big part in developing the way I, I cook. Um, you definitely have a knack for creating very novel combination. <laughs> of, I mean, just the idea of salads that with um, mm. an Asian inflection, like, like you, you've said that, you know, salads are maybe one of the least Chinese yes, uh, things definitely. ever, raw vegetables. Yes, um, which my mom does not eat. <laughs> Your mom doesn't even eat it and but she you mentioned that she also you know would suggest things like Chinese ingredients to add to your salad sometimes like maybe yeah. black fungus black fungus um, and um, seaweed and um, you know I use a lot of mung bean vermicelli like glass noodles uh, lotus root and mm -hmm. like for me when I started cooking uh, with the salad business she would come and she would like every now and then like bring my mom's very typical Chinese mom. Like nothing I do is done properly. Like she can, she can peel better than me. She can chop better than me. So basically like when we were, when I was cooking, she would just basically come and, you know, tell me I was, everything I was doing was wrong and she could do it better and all that. So it's, it's quite comical, but um, within all of that, she would bring ingredients um, for me to try. And and she was kind of right. You know, so many of these ingredients, which we didn't, we didn't eat growing up as mm -hmm. part of a salad but you know like lotus root really crunchy it stays crunchy when you've cooked it and it's really perfect for a salad um mm -hmm. because it plays off mm -hmm. like I like it a, a lot with like brussels sprouts or something like that yeah. and mm -hmm. um yeah. and that black fungus is like it soaks up flavor so well and mm -hmm. also keeps its texture um uh, and I so saw a lot of that is from being vegetarian too it's like because when you're vegetarian you're always like looking for different Mm. layers in whatever you're eating because you want like lots of umami to start with and then you want like textures to keep things interesting so I think that's one of the like not eating meat is one of the things that makes me create like these kind of what you call like novel combinations yeah. is because I'm vegetarian and because I'm always looking for these different textures in my food um if that could also... be you also identified an ingredient that I don't know many Americans would that is vegetarian and super umami and you combined it with miso but it is your recipe for buttery miso Vegemite noodles. <laughs> I know we're not cooking that tonight but you, you wrote in the head note that it's something that you carried around in your head for years <laughs> before yes, talking yes. about it. Now it's so, all coming out. What's yeah <laughs> so I mean that's been like this major hit recipe in Australia you okay know, obviously not surprising it's because so much Australians, Australians love um umami I think you know this like Vegemite is pretty much the saltiest food you're gonna find it's um it's a yeast extract for those people that don't know and we use it as a sandwich spread and so um Vegemite is like an Australian icon and Vegemite and cheese is a very popular sandwich in Australia. So for many years, I've actually wanted to create something with that combination, like a Vegemite and cheese and maybe bread. Like I, in my head, I thought it would actually be a salad, 
Like I thought I would like impregnate some bread with like some buttery Vegemite um, mixture and then bake it off and make it into croutons um, mm. and then combine it with something else. But I ended up doing these <laughs> Vegemite noodles with miso. So this, this recipe, is, it's really easy. Um, but it does have like a hell of a lot of umami in it. There's Vegemite, there's miso, and there's butter. And I just put it in instant noodles and, and it's yeah. just, it's wild. It's so good. And um, my kids Brilliant. love it. So it's- Okay, um, get approved. <laughs> get approved. But it's it's one of, for me, it's, it's kind of like all, it's kind of like me like mashed together in a, in a, in a dish. Um, because for me, like going up Vegemite, Vegemite sandwiches was what made me feel Australian. Like, so every, even though like every night I was eating a Cantonese banquet for dinner at school, I got to take a Vegemite sandwich to school and it kind of made me feel more Australian. So it, you know, it actually means a lot to me, that sandwich <laughs> and Vegemite itself. Like, you know, I think most Australians who, most Australian expats will have a pantry full of Vegemite jars which I, I do. I'm curious to see what else you do because now I can see you being a lot of like maybe mixing your dipping sauce. I don't know. I don't know. Just putting that up there. Um, should we should we go back to your, your wontons for a second? Uh, yeah, sure. So I've got some, these are just, you know, twin marquee wonton wrappers. I think people are often very interested in brands. Um, I do find, I don't know about you, Kathy, but I do find that getting a good quality wonton wrapper makes yeah. a huge difference because oh yeah. sometimes I get you know like ones that you get from just your everyday supermarket and they oh, no. break a you lot break. I've noticed that as well um yeah so this is um this is a more fresh I think maybe it's just fresher it, it is it's fresher and it's a bit thinner I think yeah and you know traditionally you do use so this is a question I get asked a lot is about the wrappers so wonton wrappers are square and this yellow color, I think traditionally in Hong Kong, they used egg mm -hmm. in the wrapper. But I think this is the Twin Marquee brand, which I've been told is an East Coast brand. And it doesn't actually really, it doesn't have any egg in it. So I think nowadays they use, it, the, the yellow just comes from coloring. Right. Um, but that's traditionally what is used. And it, this, is, it's, this is called wonton wrapper Hong Kong style. So I do know that some other, there's other types of styles like Shanghai style, right? Is that, is that true? I thought that was just a different way of folding it. Oh, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think I heard it that way. So I'm curious to see which way you're going to fold it. I oh, I fold it. okay. Okay. So there's many different ways of folding. I'm just going to dip my finger and kind of um, do just kind of trace the, out the oh the, trace the edge trace just the top of the diamond it looks like you're doing exactly okay. exactly now you're gonna so, put it in the pitcher's place aren't you okay so i'm gonna do about i don't know if you can see but about that much but maybe oh. you know a little bit more than a tablespoon but okay. you know less is more if you're starting out making dumplings or wontons um just don't overfill it to start with because it just makes it harder to handle um so you know less is more is is one of the general rules I would say if you're starting out. So there's so many ways to fold a uh, wonton. I think everyone has their own method. Um, in the book, I show it like this, which is basically like form a triangle. Okay. So you seal all along. Yes, so it's a, it's a triangle. And it's important to get all the air out. So just mm -hmm. um, kind of press around the filling. And so if it was too soupy, you know, too much liquid, then it wouldn't stick together because it's like. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it would kind of I've been there. You know, break the skin. <laughs> yep. Yes. And like, don't be afraid. It, sometimes uh -huh. the skin um, will just break. It, it's not you. Sometimes the skin, it, it's dry or it's not, you know, yeah. the, the freshest skin. And that's where um, it will break. And then you kind of like these, I call these like the legs. So I've turned the, the triangle upside down. Um, and then you grab the two legs. I'm just going to wet one corner and then I just kind of bring it over. Beautiful. Easy and peasy. Then, 
easy peasy. So that's the way that's shown in the book. Um, I think, I don't know what this is called, this one. Is it called the Ingot or, you know, how they, some of them have names now? Yeah. <laughs> Not names that I would have used, but um, yes, I'm just going to pop that over golden, there. The um, ancient exactly. golden currency, the Ingot. But there's lots of different ways. I'm going to, so it's important to kind of keep your, your wrappers um, under some sort of damp towel because well, they dry out so quickly and the other question I've been asked before is on some sides there's lots of flour oh and on some sides the other side there isn't um and which side should I use I will use usually use the side with with le less flour mm -hmm. um but no big deal really so I'm going to show you a different fold um this is the one that my mother did growing up and I, I kind of call it a tadpole and so basically it's you kind of just gather everything up like. kind of push the corner in and then you push the other corner in and then you just squeeze it together oh my goodness so that okay. is actually i yep. seen this called the hong kong fold yep but this is really how my mum made her wontons <laughs> um so it's kind of like but it's hard to describe so when you put it in a book, it's like in family, I think it is hard to describe. I do have one wonton recipe in there, and that's how I describe it. And I've had people say to me, oh, I don't really understand what you meant by just grabbing it together. But it, it is like some of these folds are all um it's like a gathered purse. It is, it is. And like it depends. I, I think my mum, when her when she made them, she would use like quite big wonton sheets. And so it would actually have like quite a long tail. So uh -huh. I would say, oh, it looks like a tadpole or something uh -huh. like a, some sort of fish. So yeah, I just kind of like hold it so they're like not um, not pressed together. And then I just kind of push that side in and that side in and then just basically squeeze it. Yeah. So it's all shut. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, make sure you seal them properly. The sealing them properly is kind of very important. So um, now, did your mom always boil them? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. We only really ate them one way. Um, and so that's boiled in, in soup. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously hers had pork, usually pork and shrimp. Yeah. Um, that combination, quite a classic combination um and we had them with um these noodles which i do have some here because i went to the asian grocery so these are very traditional wonton mm -hmm. noodles um egg noodles and very yellow looking um and that's how we ate it so it, it would be in broth with those noodles and some wontons Mm -hmm. and yeah it was and she my mom always had wonton so it's in the freezer they fro they freeze really well mm -hmm. so after you've made them you can what I usually do is just put them on a piece of parchment paper on, on a small tray like one of those very small sheet pans and I'll put that in the freezer and once they ha harden up you can take them off and put them in a ziploc bag or a ziploc or a um or a container Mm -hmm. and you can always have wontons ready to go at a moment's notice. I love how you are staying pretty traditional with that recipe, right? With your oh, with yeah. wontons. Mm -hmm. But you just mentioned sheet pan, and I do have to ask about <laughs> that dish, the sheet pan chow mein. And how did you ever think that was, that was going how to- How did I think it was okay? <laughs> going to work. And what'd your mom think? Oh, your, or your mom thinks that everything. My mom thinks that everything I do is a little bit nuts anyway. So she would have been not surprised at any recipe okay. or technique I would come up She's with. Like, yep. She has a saying, if, we'll it's not weird, if it's not weird, you're not going to attempt it, are you? So that's like, that's but my mom's very traditional. I like so that. She thinks anything is weird. Um, but anyway, I came up with that because what I love about chow mein in particular like a Cantonese chow mein which yes. is 
um, made with noodles, not very similar to what I just showed you. So like usually an egg noodle. Um, what I love about it most is the crispiness, but then the sauciness that happens, sauciness. that combination. So mm -hmm. it needs, I don't want it to be all crispy. Don't want it to be all soft. I want, I, I want that crispiness. Yeah. And then I want True. the sauce that goes over and makes some of the noodles soft. Mm -hmm. And so I love being a busy mom of three. I love things that are hands off, you know, that I can just kind of throw something on and walk away for 10 minutes and do something else. So I don't know. So one day I just thought, oh, I might try putting noodles just in the oven and see what happens. And I just, they, I, when I took them out, I was like, wow, these are so, these are way crispier than I imagined. And they didn't they totally stick. No. Huh. So the end result is um, very similar to what you'd get from a very good chow mein, which is, you know, that combination of crispy and soft, because not all of it gets crispy, um, just the bits kind of around the, around the edge. So. Mm -hmm. That is really, it's really a good cool. one. That is a fun. really cool idea. Yeah. Um, all right. So I would love to keep asking you questions. Oh, I do wanted to get, I did want to get back to, you know, these um, little, you know, dis differences between the cuisines that you grew up with and mm -hmm. what you're doing now. And, um, you know, you've been a vegetarian now for 25 years. Yes um a long time and so you've been tooling around with really flavorful vegetarian entrees and and also salads for 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 some time now and mm -hmm. um going back to that idea of the raw food which is never really um it's kind of looked down upon in chinese culture right yeah yeah who so who's who's right here <laughs> do you ever have arguments with your relatives over the merits to both arguments and uh and why do we even have such a big dichotomy around salads and, and raw foods in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think within, I think there are certain um, Asian cultures, like Vietnamese have a lot of, but many more salads, you many know, like salads. many more salads and and eating food raw. But for, you know, for in Chinese culture, my mom in particular says, you know, raw food is, it brings, it makes your body cold, you know, it, it brings you and it, you'll get colds from it and it's just not good for digestion. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all those kind of ideas. I don't particularly think that she's wrong. I don't think that, that I think that, you know, Eastern medicine is pretty amazing and, and it makes a lot of sense, even though sometimes it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've kind of learned to just kind of trust those beliefs because they've been around a long time. And sometimes I like it when I don't fully understand something, but it's just <laughs> the way it is. You know, yeah. my mom is Taoist. So um, there is just this kind of her attitude to things. It just is, it's just, it's just that the way it is. So I kind of, I do subscribe to that a little bit, but I'm also very happy to go my own way and break some rules and uh <laughs> as every good chinese daughter does and i mean and there's so many fun ones there's the bibimbap salad bowl that you have uh, a pasta salad with umeboshi vinaigrette um so yeah breaking rules is breaking rules is kind of what <laughs> i like to do and in food i think it's it's important because you know, some people, I mean, particularly lately, as, as you know, people get very wrapped up in authenticity and what's right and who owns what. And I just think at the end of the day, it's all food. And we, yes, it's important. The most important thing is to, is to honor the origins of food and where it comes from. And, um, but after we've done that, I mean, it is, it should be a celebration of, um, you know, where who we are as people and for me it's it's such an expression of who I am and the experiences I've had um growing up and being part of the world and then having a lot of influences you know away from my natural surroundings from away from Australia and and I I think it's natural that I'm going to want to embrace all of that in the way I cook and my recipes so mm -hmm. um you know, I, I, 
for me, cooking and food and writing recipes, writing a book, it's got to have a reason for it. You know, I'm not going to just write a recipe just because it's trendy or someone asked me to. There's got to be a reason. And for me, like every recipe I develop is a story. You know, mm-hmm. that recipe is, is mm-hmm. telling a story of something. There is right. there is a personal connection for me to an ingredient or to to that recipe because I experienced it and it's a, an important memory for me. Um, and I think, you know, by being really personal in the way I approach every recipe, it, there's, it makes it, um, it almost resonates more with people. You know, the more personal you are, it, it resonates more because people can see themselves in that story. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important in food to, to remember, you know, why, why we're writing a recipe, even if it's just a recipe, you know, like we need to remember why, why are we doing it? Like, why, how is this going to apply not only to you, but to a lot of people? And um, yeah, it's something I'm always keeping in mind. doesn't matter if I'm writing a recipe, writing a book. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's important. Well, I love that. I, and it really speaks to me. Um, and um, I think that it reflects a, a huge, a, a huge, a lot of people and how, how they cook today. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start taking questions from the Q&A. If okay. you guys want to start typing in here. Um, we have a question from Beth, who has your first three cookbooks and the uh, the newest one is on the way right now, and she loves your cooking and your writing. Oh, yeah. She asks, she asks, do you have any favorite recipes that you always come back to? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> on an everyday basis? No, no, no. Um, yeah, I, I, I do cook make a lot from. I, I do. I cook a lot from my books. Uh, often don't follow the recipe anymore but you know I cook from like kind of muscle memory so Uh um all the books all the recipes in community for example I had cooked over four years like over and over and over so those flavors and every single one is so familiar to me like sometimes I'll make one of those salads and I'll take a bite and I just rem it just comes back you know oh that day I was riding my bike down that street or you know those salads are so ingrained in my palate you know um but I do like cook a lot from my own books yeah um because the books are basically the things that I cook at home so Mm -hmm, you know like the salt and vinegar potatoes in this into Asia with love is probably Mm-hmm. One of the recipes I cook the most because it's basically potatoes and chilies and um, vinegar and soy sauce. And it's just something that, you know, I always have potatoes at home. So when I cook for my family, it tends to be like very, you know, a lot of comfort food because my kids are, are hungry kids and, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's stuff that's going to fill them up. But, you and know, the, it, largely the way, what you see in my books is the way I eat at home. So Sounds like it. And I love that stir fried salt and vinegar potato on page 153. Oh, it's so good. We make it a lot. So Tom asks, <clears throat> oh, okay. We, we answered that actually. So we're, Michael is gonna answer the names of your three books and where you can find them in Canada. Um, so Kat asks if there are any particular foods that you miss from Australia that just tastes better in Australia, like maybe the fresh produce <laughs> or things, or can you, can you actually get everything that you want in, in New York? Is that trying to be controversial? <laughs> okay, I don't know, so is there anything that's like super fresh and good? Well, you know what, Kathy, so much of your memory of what tastes good is laced with experience oh. and it's laced with memories and so sometimes like in my head, I think a lot of things taste better in Australia. Like for example, I had this obsession with Australian peanut butter and I was like convinced that peanut butter in Australia tasted better, even though it's like a way bigger product here and there's more range. Um, and so I asked my sister to send me peanut butter. And when I tasted it, when it got here, it wasn't better. 
<laughs> actually. And I was like really surprised that it was not what I had in my yeah. head because I think, you know, so much of what we ha- ha- hold in our heads is, is mm. you know, our taste is our memories um, influence the mm. way we, we remember things. I was in a good mood. Yeah. Exactly. Or, you know, I was a kid and everything was so I awesome. Was love. And easy and... I remember eating that on a particular biscuit. There's lots of foods I miss, you know, a lot of the little, um, you know, the what we call biscuits, what you call, you call them crackers here, you know, all those kind of um, supermarket things. Yeah. But, um, okay. you know, we, I always food. have um, yeah. junk foods, <laughs> chips. Chip. I always have um, passion fruit, tinned passion fruit in my pantry. I probably got about 10 tins right now. Um, so, Passion fruit to me is like a very Australian, like with a lot of desserts um, with passion fruit in them. There's a couple actually in this book. There's a passion fruit caramel with some sago in in this book. So passion fruit is such an Australian flavor to me. We have it on, you know, a lot of our desserts. So I am very reliant (laughs) on having passion fruit in my pantry. So Whenever I go back, which hasn't been, I haven't been back to Australia for three years now, particularly um, mainly because of COVID, um, but I'll bring back a lot of tins of passion fruit or I'll have them sent over. But my sister sends quite a lot of care packages. So wow. I always have a... Um, but why tinned? They didn't have it fresh in Australia? Oh, you had it fresh oh, too. Okay. But, you know, I can't bring t- fresh over here. So oh, the tin passion fruits. Yeah, I always find it hard to find. You can find oh. it frozen. Oh, okay. Maybe I just, I'll give you the hookup, Hetty. Next time okay. I see you, I'm coming to, with a, with a passion fruit. Okay. <laughs> but okay. No, yeah, no, the, I see what you mean. Cause also it's like the juice. You could go in a can, okay. Yeah. Um, oh no, it's actually really good in a can. Yeah, it's yeah, fresh. it's not that, right, right. So one of the things you mentioned was, you know, it's so dependent, our perception is so dependent on the time and the place. Um, That reminds me of one of your recipes, which is called life-changing udon. (laughs) You you had a really good bowl of udon that you wrote, kind of ruined you for all other noodle soups forever. And this was in Japan. Tell us about this life-changing event. Yes, it wasn't that long ago, actually. It was in 2018. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in Hong Kong for work. I was developing some recipes for a restaurant there. And after that, I, I managed to get up to Japan. It was over Christmas and my husband met me there with the kids. So we were all there in Japan. Hadn't done any research, but I was told by a friend to go to Shin Udon, um, an Australian friend. So there we go. We, we hang out. We get there. It's this tiny place. We're standing outside for like 20, 30 minutes which was a blessing because the whole time we're waiting for a table, we're looking through the window and looking at this guy making udon from scratch. It was just the most incredible process. Now he's in this tiny kitchen, smaller than mine, and just shelling out this, um, you know, doing the dough and, and it's all cooked, it's cooked fresh. So it's cooked fresh and brought to your, like, to your, like, it's, I, we sat at the counter and just imagine eating like noodle that fresh that's been mm. made like seconds before it's served to you. And, you know, the strands are thick and toothsome. It's like just this beautiful mouthful. And um, this particular little place, it's quite famous. I think a lot of people have been there. But, um, you know, they do very well kind of this east, east meets west kind of flavors for their. Oh, okay. So they had one that was kind of like a carbonara inspired um udon with um I think it was a bacon tempura I think my son ate it. my son oh ordered my it uh, so it's kind of like really intense flavors but my one had um you know what's in the book is basically like my attempt uh-huh. to create some that That's experience protected. again <clears throat> but it's got black pepper um oh. hot soy and um butter that kind yeah. of melts through it and I just had such an appreciation for it because it's just it you know changed the way I thought about udon Mm -hmm. you know it it just it just really like challenged every experience I've had of that of that dish Um, and that's something that I find so inspiring in the way 
Japanese not only approach food but life because they 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 take so many um, Western techniques and flavors and they they just perfect it and they they do something that's so it it's so different but it feels so genuine and authentic even though it's something really new and I find that just so inspiring because they yeah they have this wonderful way of um, putting flavors together and making something really special so I um I was very that was a very inspiring food trip for me hmm. I'm gonna make that really soon you sold me um <laughs> oh Miriam asks what suggestions you have for cooking your recipes for one person I know you're ah, making enough wontons right now for yes. farming or or to freeze ahead yes. or something yes <laughs> So I think that, you know, any of the noodle, there's a whole noodle chapter um, in this and any of the noodles um, uh, would be really easy to make for one because okay. you can you just reduce the amount of noodles. Even if you want to make the whole broth, like I often will freeze um, the broth. So if I don't okay. use up all the broth, um, I think I've got some broth in my freezer at the moment. I'll just put it you know in the freezer and then the next time you can make oh, a fresh a bunch yeah. of noodles and then you have the broth you can just defrost it um things like the um, wontons dumplings all that is very freezeable mm -hmm. um there's even a fresh noodle recipe in there that's that's very freezeable so mm -hmm. I'm a big I love my freezer my mom <laughs> I think I mentioned in the book my mom <laughs> had three freezers in her house and still <laughs> yeah. does that was um, impressive she's um, impressive she doesn't do things by halves so no. I think the freezer is your friend um, and don't be afraid to to use it um yeah. to freeze almost anything to be honest but um what oh. else what? looking for one we have another question um a couple more so I know mm -hmm. we're almost out of time but maybe uh Lisa asks she's curious if there's any differences in the way your books um, or any specific recipes perhaps are received by your Australian audience compared to your US audience. And you mentioned Asian food is perhaps more prevalent in Australia compared to the US. So whether that might factor. No, I actually find that people absolutely love my Asian recipes um, in, in the US. In, in Australia, um, Obviously, they love they they love the salad books. The salad books are like mm. you know part of the culture there. So um, I think that I did notice when I first moved here a difference because in Australia, uh, you know, my first two books are salad books, but people were like when Neighborhood was my first book to launch in America, and there was a perception that the meals in there weren't salads. There uh. was this conversation had you know at, when we were first. Um, printing it that are you sure these are salads are these just vegetarian main meals to me and to anyone in Australia they're salads um, and we have a different idea of what a salad is yes because I think in America like a lot of salads are still very leaf based mm -hmm. you know like lettuce mm -hmm. and you know arugula and those types of things whereas in Australia it's just anything that's really served at room temperature um, mm -hmm. yeah so we have a more maybe a liberal approach to what what a salad is and you don't see a lot of leafy salads in Australia actually yeah um, yeah here you have to be like you cannot have like lettuce greens and have a salad yeah yeah, yeah exactly exactly oh huh. interesting well yeah. okay um and and finally Hannah asks um Congratulations. How has your love for Asian food been impacted by living in the States, if at all? Um, I think I've le definitely learned to make more Asian foods and definitely been exposed to more Asian foods okay. since I moved here. Because I think that, you know, immigration is um, such an interesting thing um, from so many levels, but in terms of what you're exposed to, you know, like in Australia, I think that we're very exposed to certain Asian foods, um, you know, like Chinese, Thai, Indonesian, um, Vietnamese. And when I came to America, I discovered Northern Chinese food, 
those flavors oh. were not that prevalent in Australia because just purely because of in, immigration, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of the Chinese population when I was growing up was um, Southern Chinese, like people from Southern China, you know, um, Cantonese speakers, speakers. That's changed now, but um, at the time, and Korean food was mm. a huge revelation for me because mm. Korean food in Australia back then, not now, but back then was Korean barbecue. And they were all Korean slash Japanese restaurants. Um, and we really didn't experience just these right. amazing like the restaurants you you have in New York um just incredible flavor and I just love Korean food I love how spicy it is um I love the funky flavors it's just something that I've really been um felt really fortunate to to live here and to learn about that cuisine and to embrace those flavors and combine it with you know other things that I've already been cooking so like um, the cover here with your with your bibimbap inspired yes, salad yes yes bibimbap is basically a salad in my mind so um <laughs> <laughs> not a rice bowl is a rice bowl a salad it's, in australia yeah it would be a salad oh okay if it's, if it's cold like if it's, if it's in a bowl huh yeah okay. <laughs> everything's a salad we love salad salad okay i know i'm getting the hang of it well Penny, this is just so exciting. What what else are you doing here with your wonton? So now you're well, just- I'm, I'm basically making my dinner now for my family yeah. um, who've made themselves scarce, but they'll be home soon. So yeah. Um, yeah, I hope that was fun for people that they could see mm -hmm. one of the recipes. And I was like really excited to show, you know, like some of the, the, the vegan or vegetarian ways of making things like dumplings and wonton. Yeah. Cause I think that there was this kind of perception that um most dumplings have meat in them so um you know there's a whole season of dumplings in this this book that uh is all vegetarian so oh, i love it i yeah. can't wait to, to dig in i'm i'm gonna need to make some dumplings tonight too <laughs> <laughs> it's a little late but you know you just made like yeah. what two dozen just now yeah i've made quite a While few talking. yeah thank That's you way to, to do it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun.